I happen to agree with this. <laughs> well, nowadays, we, uh, all these things that were considered so insane 35 years ago have come home to roost, which all goes to say that, of course, Hans Keller has indeed made a major, overwhelming, profound change in not only life here, but life abroad. There's a great German scholar uh, who uh, uh, writes widely on a range of various subjects, and he recently said to me that he considered that the Hans Keller was perhaps the most profoundly uh, influential musical mind in the second part of the 20th century. How about that? He fiercely stands to his convictions, sometimes surprising convictions, but he loves a good argument and is open to argument if it comes from the right person. He's an individualist and he wants other people to be as individual as possible. I was amazed to see that uh, somebody who was so outspoken and even aggressive in his writings was so amiable and charming. I would like to talk about my often so described aggression. Well, criticism. When a music critic tears a composer or performer to pieces one per week, is never regarded as aggressive. But when somebody comes and tears one music critic per week to pieces, he's being regarded as highly aggressive. In short, what I'm leading down to is that all of us are aggressive, but we have to think how we ought to employ our aggression. And I've made it a principle to employ my aggression fruitfully. And by fruitfully, I don't mean anything vague. By fruitfully, I mean aggression in the service of defending something worthwhile. I heard him deliver a lecture many years later that was one of the finest lectures on music I have ever witnessed. He managed to explain and demonstrate certain aspects of Haydn's string quartets in a way that was extremely fascinating to a musician, but also accessible to the layman. I think that he was a terrific writer who was never fully understood or appreciated during his lifetime, but will be found more and more interesting if our culture survives. Uh, his main thing, from my point of view, was to make pleas on behalf of talent and invention and individualism, always asking that we respect the idiosyncrasy of artists and requiring us to bear in mind how much is owed uh, to that, uh, to their unruliness, even their destructiveness, perhaps. Um, now, that was something that he argued for uh, in music and in art very, very well. Um, but he also argued for it in football. Um, he was the best writer on soccer that this country has had, in my opinion. In uh, 1970, for instance, he was making this kind of remark about uh, the kind of football he approved of. Um, one of the golden rules was don't run. Show your fight in your brain and your ability. The stupidest sight is front runners hectically pursuing a running, retreating defense. The same result would be obtained if both sides walked. The Brazilians indeed walk, look, and think where there is no need to dart. Then they explode. Hans uh, Keller was a special fan because as he played the game himself in the early days, he played it his own way in those days in Austria, and the Austrians really were a stylish team way back. And, and he'd grown up in that, so that's what appealed to him. And obviously, as he was a musician man, as a man of music, he wanted something with rhythm and excitement and, and, and drum beats and everything like that in it. 
and he also, like I was, was against the, uh, the attitudes of coaching, that, that people could be coached to do certain things. You can drill people into doing things like you do in the army, but you don't get the best out of their talents. And for instance, if you had somebody very fast, you didn't want him to think. You could get the slower guys to do the thinking. You wanted him to run and knock the ball into the, into the game. Early in his life, he wanted to become a professional psychoanalyst, but a close friend of Freud's advised him that the training was financially beyond him. Typically, Hans was undaunted and went on alone. And not much later, that same friend, the analyst Willie Hoffer, had to describe him as having an unequaled knowledge of psychoanalytic literature. The ethics and psychology of psychology caught his imagination. He questioned the very premise of analysis and the role of the analyst and scrutinized the accepted concepts of neurosis and psychosis to illuminate that both conditions could surprisingly intensify reality, serving normality. He analyzed what made genius, genius. It all started with five years self-analysis. The form it took was that I sat down every day for an hour with a pencil and wrote free associations, whatever came into my mind. My knowledge of psychoanalysis proved as a grave obstacle because I always started interpreting instead of letting it out. So that obstacle amounted to a defense against my unconscious. Once I had firmly decided, however, not to interpret, but just to let it flow, it went much better. Five years of it, changed my life. At the end of it, I knew far better who I was and I could distribute my psychic energies far more economically. Freud himself did nothing but self-analysis. That's how he made his major discoveries. He did it every night before falling asleep, which meant that he fell asleep when the resistances became too strong. The method adopted is, therefore, far preferable. When I had written a number of psychoanalytical papers, a close collaborator of Freud's, Hoffer was his name, contrived to issue me with a pass so that I could attend the library of the Psychoanalytic Institute whenever I wanted. His power of intelligence was such that he could write about a range of things. Uh, he, one of his main themes is psychology, a Freudian tradition, which he knew as few people have known it, uh, and which he was also able to criticize to effect. The uh, position with uh, Keller was that the uh, various sodalities and institutes of psychoanalysis in London on occasion barred him from witnessing their uh, colloquia and debates. Uh, and of course he was quite right to point out what an abysmal piece of nonsense that was for psychoanalysis to regard itself as a secret society in that sense and bar their critics because they knew they would be critical. That's what happened. He was on occasion kept out just as in other ways he was distrusted uh, for his best qualities distrusted.
Years later, when he discovered the famous analyst Thomas Satz had been working on similar ideas to his own, typically excited by the coincidence, he produced the talks that he invited Satz to give for the BBC, part of the famous In Short series. Uh, one of the many things I very much admired in Hans was his uh, amazing knowledge of not just about, as he would say, of the, of the Viennese classics. He, he knew countless scores uh, inside out, and he seemed to be able to penetrate their structural secrets, you might say, more deeply than other people. He was in the BBC for almost exactly 20 years, and uh, in his very many different jobs during this period, he must have covered almost the entire range of music broadcasting. He began as a talks producer, then went on to chamber music, then to orchestral music. Then I think he edited the orchestral programs of, of the BBC's regional orchestras. And then in his last nine years, when I was hardly there, uh, he went into the field of new music. I think that in the field of new music, he set himself uh, the special task of reading every single score that was submitted to the BBC reading panel, as it was called. And that must have taken a very great deal of his time. When the BBC decided to abolish the third program, I started a rebellion which drew ever wider circles and in which plenty of BBC staff members participated. <clears throat> we did not want third program to shut down and the further history of Radio 3 proves, I think, how right we were. The main differences between Radio 3 and the third program are five. One, the third program confined itself to broadcasts which were not otherwise available in the concert hall or elsewhere. Two, the third program did not have continuous music, so that music never ran the risk of being used as mere background. Three, the third program produced shows which one could not produce outside radio. Four, the third program established a unity between successive programs. Five, and the most important, the third program had a rhythm, so that you could listen all evening without using it at any stage as a background. Radio 3, after all, is a daytime music program, which inevitably, ineluctably, is being used as mere background. Public service broadcasting is a euphemism for overstimulation as are all the duties which the mass communicator is supposed to have in order to make all the things available which the public is supposed to want. If the mass communicator has one demonstrable duty, it is thou shalt not overstimulate and prevent independent thought. At our present stage, there is simply no danger of under-stimulation. I devoted so much of my time to radio because, in my opinion, radio plays an enormous role in the musical life of a country. That is to say, one can, through one's radio work, help good music to develop and bad music to shut up. Mm -hmm. 